if you think race relations in this country are a little bit fraught from time to time, um, and they are, I mean, it's the nature of race relations around the world that they are fraught. Different cultures, different ethnic backgrounds, different heritage, different histories, uh, different perspectives. Um, then you might like to head across to the Tasman, uh, which is going through something called um, a, a referendum. Well, the Australian Indigenous Voice Referendum, which will take place later on, I think, this year. Anyhow, our next guest will be able to work that out. Um, we have the Treaty of Waitangi in this country, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, um, as it's now known and been changed without public debate or discussion, but there you go, um, which uh, has been interpreted for, oh gosh, ever since 1975 uh, and then certainly in the late 80s, early 1990s in a certain way to define what those principles of the treaty are and then to apply them in daily life. They have caused a great deal of friction, obviously, in both their interpretation and in their application, and we're sort of still working through that now. Um, but when the British government um, and its settlers then went to Australia, um, well, most of them forcibly repatriated there, uh, unlike New Zealand, um, they did not have a similar arrangements with the indigenous folk and so in the 21st century, um, after 23 years of the 21st century, there is a suggestion that the voice of the Indigenous people should have some form of, I guess, constitutional, yes, constitutional role. Uh, the Australians have a constitution, we don't. Well, we actually do have a constitution, we've got a constitution act, but that's all it says. It's just the name of the act and I think the preamble, but it doesn't mean anything here. Um, Australia actually does have a constitution and they have a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise that the first peoples of Australia, that is the Aborigines and the Torres Strait Islanders, who I guess are Aborigines who originate from the Torres Strait, but our next guest will be able to tell us that as well, um, to establish a direct voice to Parliament for them. Um, and a referendum on this um, is going to take place later on this year. Now, the really interesting background to this, as and I just read, what do I read? The Sydney Morning Herald, The Australian, occasional Nine News report. So I'm sort of filtering my news through the, those aspects, uh, was that there was, appeared to be overwhelming support for um, uh, the voice to, to, to Parliament uh, and the amendment to the Constitution. But in recent times, that seems to have founded somewhat and it's now very, very close indeed. To give us a bit of an update on it, but also something of the flavour of what's happening in Australia to do with this, why it might or might not be needed. Um, former Wallaby, uh, I think he played a couple of tests against New Zealand, not in winning teams as I understand. Oh, maybe, maybe not. No, wait on. It was in the 80s, golden era of Wallaby rugby, but also political commentator, columnist, author, um, and all-round media personality in Australia. Peter Fitzsimons, and he joins us now. Thank you very much for joining us, Peter. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yes, I'm an admirer of your Waitangi Treaty. I don't pretend to fully understand it, but I remember being very impressed, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that it was because of the Waitangi Treaty that in the late 80s, Maori TV was established, is that right? Uh, in part, yeah. Um, as um, yeah. Well, as it was, if that was to do with the Maori language, the preservation of the Maori language. Um, not just Māori TV, but Māori Radio as well. Um, yeah. Yes, well, we settled, our countries are settled differently. Um, we all know how Australia was settled and ours was settled um, perhaps a little bit more ordered way. Nevertheless, there was a lack of a constitutional um, understanding or acceptance of Aboriginal and Torres Islands initially. Tell us, why is this... Why has this come about, this this idea to give Aborigine and Torres Strait Islanders a direct voice into Parliament? Because it has been, been recognised. I mean, the history of black and white Australia is a very, very difficult one. I worked for the Sydney Morning Herald. We recently did a correction for a... For a uh, editorial we wrote in 1837 um, about the Maya Creek where we basically took on appalling position that you know the white man had the right to kill the black man and we did a correction for it and that's that is part of and it, up until 1967 indigenous people in Australia didn't have the right to vote and uh, 
it's in recent decades there's been growing recognition of just what how 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 appalling the treatment of white Australians historically was to to the people of the First Nations and a recognition that the there needs to be systemic change to close the gap because by and large Indigenous Australians have been left a long way behind white Australians and so there's been this recognition, there's been many attempts over the years to give Indigenous people a greater say in their own affairs and of all the words that have been written and said about the voice, the best words, the one that cut through for me was the former Liberal politician Fred Cheney who said Aboriginal people simply want to be consulted on matters that affect Aboriginal people. And there have been, over the years, I think seven iterations of you know, an Indigenous body, an advisory body to advise on Indigenous matters, but then governments change and those bodies have been done away with. And the idea of the voice is to establish a an advisory body, simply an advisory body, not with power of veto, an advisory body body to to advise on matters that affect Indigenous people. So as an example, at the moment there's been lots of terrible headlines coming out of Alice Springs mm -hmm. uh, of bad behaviour after dark and arrests and vandalism and all the rest. And it's a shocking problem. But the, the approach, people will say, well, yeah, how's the voice going to help that? Well, the answer is we've tried many, many different solutions um, in our history and they clearly haven't worked. And so let us, let us consult people that will understand, likely understand better than white folk can understand what the issues are, how policy can be changed and consult people the Aboriginal people on matters that affect Aboriginal people. And you mentioned that, you know, it's lost favour in recent times. And that's true. That it, it, There's been, you know, a very strong campaign. Uh, basically, the Libs, it was hoped that this would be a bipartisan effort and the Libs would go with it too. And right up until Peter Dutton said he was against it, there was still hope that it would be a bipartisan effort to establish the voice. Right, um, but as I understand it, um, the negative to the referendum campaign for a yes vote is not simply from what you'd call the conservative faction, or mostly conservative white folk, I guess, white nation folk in Australia, but also from more liberal, shall we say, left um, Aborigine as well, who say that this isn't good enough, so it fails their particular test too. Yeah, is that right? That's that's true. That's true. There has been prominent Indigenous people and politicians who've come out against it. I mean, it's very evenly split at the moment. Historically, in Australia, it is very difficult to get referendums passed. I'm not sure how it works in New Zealand, but in Australia, we need a majority of people in a majority of states. And I I stand to be corrected, but I think it's. I think the last successful referendum in Australia was 1977. And, of course, we had the failed Republic referendum, sadly, in 1999. Um, well, um, it's interesting that you say that because in New Zealand it's slightly different. Obviously, we've only got... We don't have the states. So the referendums... We've had a number of referendums that have passed, Peter, in the 50... You just need a majority, is that Yeah, it? that's right. You just need a bare majority. Uh, a good example of that was um, voluntary euthanasia. Uh, 2020 last election here, um, two thirds of New Zealand voted for it, and um, and now we have voluntary euthanasia, or at least uh, the rudiments of. Um, and, in this and may, I, may I ask? May I ask on that because I love New Zealand. I'm interested in New Zealand. I imagine that you say 66 percent passed, so so a third of the people um, were against it. I'm sure you had prominent people saying, if this passes, it'll be a disaster, there'll be death squads, etc., etc. Mm, mm. And just as we had in Australia for same-sex marriage, marriage equality, we had people saying, if this goes through, people will be marrying animals, they'll be marrying bridges, they'll be doing terrible things. And the truth of it is that <laughs> marriage equality came in and everybody got on with their lives, and it, but... but Gay, 
gay people were recognised as having the right to marry. Voluntary euthanasia has come in, in uh, it's, it's coming in all over Australia. Again, we've had people, prominent people saying, this will be terrible, it'll all, it'll all, it'll it'll all be uh, death panels and so forth and the answer is no all it means is that very ill people that no longer want to live can can leave this world in an easier fashion and so here with the voice there's been many prominent people you know again saying it'll all it'll all be terrible i i don't think it will but i think if it passes it'll be a great moment of, of reconciliation in australia um, but nevertheless, um, I mean, as you say, we've, we've got different histories in, in this area. Um, we've had, for example, political representation for Māori uh, enacted since, I think, 1861 here. So we had the Māori seat set up. Tell me, how does that work? How did that work? What happened in 1861? Um, well, there was just a view, um, 20 years after the Treaty of Waitangi, which had largely sort of passed it by by then, um, that Māori needed a say in the place, pretty much the same argument that you're using now, that Māori needed a say where the um, political decisions were going to be made in this country. And they set up four, mm. four seats, uh, 1864, I think it was, sorry. Um, and how very, how very, very wise. Yeah. Well, there have been some magnificent Māori MPs, um, obviously, since 1864. Now, um, we've, and, but this is the question you see. The really interesting thing from that now, Peter, is that we have a disproportionate representative of Māori in our parliament. So far from having just four seats, there are now, I think, 23, 24, maybe more than that, 27 uh, members of parliament of Māori descent in our current parliament um, on all sides of the political spectrum, both conservative and liberal um, and left and right. Um, but... What's the representation like of Aborigines in, and Torres Strait Islanders in your parliament, your federal parliament and in your state parliaments? Is there the same sort not of as, representation? Not as, mag, not as magnificent as yours is the answer. We've got, um, I mean, that, that's fascinating to me and cannot, given, given the history of, the, the tragic history of colonisation around the world where First Nations people, um, I, I think it's fair to say, politically are totally unrepresented when the British Empire or whichever empire expanded into them in South America and the rest, the, the Spain, Spain, Spain and Portugal. Uh, uh, the, it would be, in terms of political power, I'm sure that across the world, historically, the people of the First Nations would have been hugely disadvantaged politically. I mean, it would be very interesting to know if New Zealand's on the other side of the ledger, I'll bet they're the only ones. What a tribute to New Zealand. Um, yeah, oh, listen, we, we, we have now, the argument now is whether or not we should retain the Maori seats because um, the integration of Maori within the political system is now so absolute. But over there in Australia, I'm interested in um, the idea that... Uh, you've got such vociferous opposition um, to this from Aborigines like Warren Mundine, uh, Jacinta Price, etc. Um, key Aborigines, people with enormous respect, I would have thought, in Australia, certainly Warren Mundine, um, on their argument that this does not go far enough. Is that having a cut through in the sort of teal suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne? I live in the Teal suburb and Teal Teal Electric, and my electric's very strong for for the voice, very strong. Yes, and I think the political fallout on this. It, look, right now, with whether it will get up or not, I'm not sure. Peter Peter Dutton, it's it's looking it's looking shaky, no doubt about it. But certainly, it's not looking as as optimistic as it was for the voice to pass. And I suspect the referendum will be held mid-October, sometime around then, sometimes towards the end of the year. But I think the effect in the Teal suburbs will be, I think it'll make it more difficult for Mr Dutton to win back Teal seats because broadly the, the teal, Teals are by definition, they're progressive seats. The, the Where Teal came from, in Australia was electorates like mine that felt Tony Abbott, my former rugby coach, was our local uh, member and the 
the campaign that saw Riley Stegall beat him was Tony Abbott believes in fossil fuels, he believes in all kinds of deeply, not for same-sex marriage, um, this does not represent the people that we are in this electorate and that in six electorates across Australia that was that was the view that was taken and so the teal seats are pretty much by definition they are progressive seats they are for the voice and so Peter Dutton you know he has gone gone hard against the voice and I guess he's getting political traction on it but it, I don't think I suspect frankly there'll be more teal seats after the next election okay so um uh those who are opposed to it though are primarily i guess uh conservative forces uh as you say the liberal party are opposed to it and there are others on the conservative side as well both mm-hmm. academics and politicians etc um i guess the question is if the referendum has to pass i didn't realize that until i had this conversation it's not a national referendum so it doesn't no. It's 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 state by state. How many states does it need to pass? It needs well, there's six states and two territories. Yeah. So it needs to be in a majority of states and a majority of people. So it means that the territories contribute. So you couldn't get it up in four states, but only forty nine percent of the people. So it needs to be four states, at least four states, and um over 50 percent of the people so the territories contribute uh northern territory and the australian capital territory contribute in terms of if it, if it was 49 percent uh, without them uh, but it, it went heavily in act and heavily in the northern territory to get it up over 50 percent that's where their significance comes from but you know it should pass in new south wales it should pass in south australia um it should pass in victoria um, Queensland, WA, not sure. Tassie, not sure. So those are the three states that will stop it. Queensland. La- well, last time I saw the polls. You know, yeah, the Queensland, polls, West Australia, and, go, but and, um, and and Tasmania. I yeah. I always thought Tasmania was quite liberal. Um, I think it even had a green green parliament there for a wee while. West Australia's had a Labor premier. Queensland's, mm. yeah. Um, well, why is that? There, there's, there's huge institutional support. So I think, you know, pretty much all the major sports have come out and said we're for it. I think there's 11 major corporations that have come out and said we're for it. There's uh, all the churches and, and religions have the, the United Body of Representing Religion have said we're for it. The union movement is for it. And really the only two national institutions in Australia that have said we're against it are the Liberal Party and the National Party. And so there's institutional support. And in terms of, you know... Any, yeah, but, even if this, but Peter, even if there is this massive institutional support, and I've looked and I've seen the endorsements, as you say, why is the referendum in trouble? That's a very good question because it's it's descended because it was it was you know it was hoped that it would be by bipartisan support. Well, it's not bipartisan. It's it there are many liberals who are strongly for it and say they are strongly for it. Um, I think one of the members of the National Party left the National Party and sat on the crossbenches uh, because he was for it and said, you know, I, I'm absolutely for the voice and I want this to happen, but basically why it's fallen away is because in all the squabbling that instead of instead of sort of unity and optimism it's it's turned into dissension and narkiness is, is essentially why um all right uh now the, the other thing that i find bizarre just quietly is that no date has been set for this referendum why hmm. good question i don't know I don't know. I mean, it's, broad, it's, it's broadly been said that it'll be in... Uh, I, it, the smart money says in mid-October, but I don't know. I, it may be because the, the numbers have gone down. Maybe they'll wait longer. I don't know. So don't know. Is, does that mean that <laughs> Prime Minister Albanese, he sets the date, does he? Well, the Labor Party, the, the, the government sets the date. And right. Mr Albanese would have a pretty strong say. And so you're suggesting that maybe there's some equivocation around the date because... They want know. it to pass? I have no inside knowledge whatsoever, but what I'm saying is you're quite right. There is no date. 
um, and I must, but no, I suspect it will be mid October, but maybe they'll delay. I don't know, but no, I don't know. I do not know that part. Okay, um, all right. I, I understand your sympathy for the voice, um, but it's just the, the thing that struck me really was interesting. I, I couldn't understand why something that seemed so sort of non-controversial to start with. You've explained that you're suggesting, well, no, no, no. Now the national and the, and the country party, or the uh, national and the liberal party, are, are going to oppose it. Um, and I guess Sky News and and all those sorts of um, conservative organisations as well as well. I think. Did I read the Australian newspaper, which is um, your national newspaper over there? It's quite conservative. Is that opposing it as well? I think so. I don't read read it much, but I, I get well broadly the conservative media is against it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And and finally, um, heading into the changing the topic completely. Um, so I apologise for that, but it's the Rugby World Cup not very far away. You obviously have got a vested interest in that. Um, we don't think we're going to win it. Um, and we're fact, Why we're don't not, you? Why don't you think you're going to win it? Oh, because we don't have the players. Um, and we don't have the coach. And um, our recent form is so patchy. Uh, and we think that the French and uh, the Irish are stronger than us because they've beaten us just recently. Uh, what about you guys? Do you have any confidence at all now that you've got Eddie Jones we'll, back? We've probably got more confidence because we've got Eddie Jones back, but we'll know more this weekend after they play South Africa. We'll see if Eddie has route a miracle. I mean, Eddie's, Eddie's track record is he's, he's the most intense coach that ever lived, and I mean that. I mean, people, you know, the stories about Eddie Jones and the intensity with his assistant coaches and, his te- and you know, the teams that he coaches are legendary, um, more, or, or I could almost say notorious, but his track record is to get results early in the first year or two or three before, before everything It all falls turns apart. Out. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, oh. we'll see. But we'll see. I mean, his, I, I, I stand to be corrected, but I think when he took over England, I think they won their first 21 test matches, something extraordinary. Mm. And so what we would hope is with Australia that, you know, as they go up against South Africa this weekend, if we can beat South Africa in South Africa, that'll be a hell of a start to boosting confidence. You've also done something else over there, just quickly, um, and you've allowed more of your international players that's plying their trades in the France, mm. the Champ Pans, to come back and represent Australia. Um, there yep. was... Is that... So it's very much the sort of South African um, selection model. Um, is that the way of the future for Australia rugby, that you are going to play... Overseas and then just bring them back for the big for the international games. Probably these are desperate times. We need to find ways to win, and so you've got a guy like Will Skelton who played for the Wallabies for a, a while. Huge, huge man, a great player, and he's one of the best players in France. And now you know he'll he'll he's turned up with the Wallabies in the middle of the Wallabies, and you know we need him for the World Cup. So that they're they're the kind of players we need back on board. And I guess it's also the relative um, strength of both New Zealand and Australian rugby at the moment in terms of dollars and what players can get offshore as well too, yeah. Well, that's the one. I'm, I'm writing one piece for this Saturday, but it's interesting in the the Ashes cricket, which is so huge at the moment. But mm. I think we've got five five tests in about as many weeks. There's, or maybe six weeks, but there's only three days between the second test and the third test. Why? Because they've just pressed them all together. Why? Because... The key players are all playing IPL and the big money bags of the game is India and they, they, they're they the ones, they're the, most, they're, they're the most influential, the IPL owners are the most influential people in the, in the world cricket because that's where all the money is. Mm. And similarly in rugby, I guess it's European rugby that has got most of the money and J- Japanese rugby. Um, I've been seeing a bit of New Zealand's favourite Robbie Deans lately he, back in back in Australia for a bit, but he's done wonderfully well in Japanese rugby, and that's you know the world changes. There's the, it's it's ever more professional, ever more money involved. Thank you very much for joining us, Peter. I appreciate your time. Um, the very best for the rest of the week. Thank you. Look at yourself. Okay, uh, it's Peter for Simons. Um, yes, he is liberal. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, Australian rugby. It's interesting in actual fact. David Pocock, remember him? Um, used to cause all sorts of bother for us at number seven for the Wallabies. Well, he's now a senator. He's a green senator, I think. Um, there's not many Wallabies that have gone into politics that haven't gone onto the left side 
of it, despite coming from relatively conservative backgrounds. Uh, and Peter Fitzsimon, obviously, is one of those. But, um, no, I just wanted to get an update for you on where that is because um, he didn't seem all that optimistic, did he, about the referendum passing over there. It was going to straighten. But now, hmm, not so. Um, we'll chat to somebody else about that close to the time. But um, Anthony Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, is trying to find a date that can maximise the voice vote. I don't know why you'd think. Maybe he thinks that I'm not going to hold it now because it's winter and people get a bit miffy in winter. The v- it's cost of living. People get a bit... Mm, I don't know. <laughs>